All right, our next speaker of the morning is Angel Foley, who's going to be telling us about factorial supersymmetric Schur functions. The microphone working? Good. All right. Okay, so this is related to some work I did in my PhD, or rather I used the work, and this was the result that Greta mentioned in her previous talk, the hamill goulden identity. So it, it's about the only word that doesn't actually appear in the title because I've used lots of lots of words, but that's that's the connection. It's actually a second connection, though, in a sense. Um, so everyone said wonderful things about Goulden and Jackson. But one thing that's implicit that hasn't really come out yet, I think, is that this conference is also a celebration of a long standing collaboration. And so when I was choosing what to talk about, obviously, the Hamill Goulden identity was was a natural thing, but also this is part of a longstanding collaboration I have with Ron King. So it was nice to be able to, to uh, highlight a, a longstanding collaboration. So I'm gonna tell you about, if I can get the slides to move. Hmm. Nothing's working. As I said, all the words are here, so I'll just move through. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. odd. Okay. It's collapse or anything like that. Is there a PDF doctor in the house? Neither is the escape. There we go. Okay, so one of the words that was on the previous slide was supersymmetric. I'm actually going to end up talking about them in a bit of a different context, but I put this slide here in case you're already familiar with them. So ultimately I'm gonna use a different kind of tableau, but if you've met them before, then this is probably the kind of tableau you've met them in. So just to get you used to the idea of supersymmetric, if you haven't seen it before, these are tableau with two kinds of entries. And we've got blue entries and we've got red entries. And they follow different rules in terms of how they're put in the tableau. So the, and I'll say more about it later when I get to the actual supersymmetric type tableau I wanna talk about in particular, not these. But essentially the blue ones follow the usual kinds of rules and the red ones follow rules, but kind of on their head. So um, in particular, the primed ones, the red ones, you're allowed two of the same in the, in the same column, but you're not allowed two of the same in the same row. So as I said, when we talk about the proper ones, then I'll say more about them. The reason we care is that you can define supersymmetric sure functions. So this again is background. Um, so also if you've met them before, then you'll be used to this kind of definition. And in essence, you weight the blue entries by X's and you weight the red entries by Y's. So you have two kinds of different entries in there. The supersymmetric sure functions are symmetric in X and they're symmetric in Y. And additionally, then there's this other little condition where if you replace one of the X's by T and one of the Y's by T, the, the result is independent of T. So it's a little bit more than just, you need to be supersymmetric in both. Just some quick history. So these showed up originally as KL uh, hook functions. And in some papers, they're still called hook functions depending on what traditions the authors follow. Um, there's lots and lots of results, so I've just listed some names at the bottom, but I'll certainly comment there's factorial variations by Molev, quasi-symmetric variations, 
And so there's lots of variations on them, but also lots of results just about them. So that was in case you've seen them before or you want to be reminded of what they are, I will be talking about them. But I want to talk first about the ninth variation sure functions, because essentially I'm going to be generalizing stuff that we've done for ninth variation sure functions. So I need to probably tell you a little bit about those. So these are defined in McDonald's 1992 paper, which is sure function theme and variations. So he goes through nine different variations on sure functions, and this is the, the last one. Um, and so he builds towards things, and because it's the last one, it includes several of the previous variations. And one of the ones it includes that's previous is the factorial sure functions, which Greta actually mentioned, and which I'm going to mention again later in the talk. So, as I said, his papers 92, it received lots of attention, um, but a lot of the attention was focused on some of the earlier variations, less so on the ninth. Um, but more recently, well, in 2001, there was a paper that looked at algebraically and combinatorially the ninth variations. But much more recently than that, there's been quite a few papers about them and about something called sure zeta functions, which I don't know much about, but are related to it. So there's a community that's that's writing uh, quite a few papers from that perspective. So I need to tell you what they are. And in the previous paper with Ron King, we looked at tableau for ninth variation sure functions. And in a sense, it's a bit of a, well, misleading in a sense, because they're the regular tableau you would like to have anyway. So you just use the regular tableau, which I've got on the left. And the color of the boxes or the colors of the numbers is significant, but I'm not going to explain the significance yet. So don't worry about the colors. Um, so you essentially take a regular old tableau. And the trick is you're going to weight it a little bit differently. Part of the weighting is going to rely on this second tableau with numbers in it that's on the right. And the numbers in this are not filling numbers like you would normally put in according to row and column restrictions. This is simply the content of the boxes. So the content is the difference between the column index and the row index. And I've just filled them in. So the main diagonal has content zero always. And then as you move up, you get the positive contents and you move down the negative ones. So I've used uh, a bar over an I to mean minus I just to keep it sort of centered in the tableau. So content stays constant along each of the diagonals. Content's really important for the ninth variation sure functions. So your normal ordinary sure functions, you take the tableau and you weight by an X subscripted by whatever the entry is in the box. So we've got X sub K. So that's the usual sure function definition. If we want to do the ninth variation sure functions, we have X, but we weight it by two numbers. We weight it by the K. So that's the entry in the tableau in the box, but also by the content. So that was the entry from the second. So it's got a sort of a double subscript. So if we have those, then we have defined, Ron and I, determinal identities for ninth variation sure functions. And they look like this. So I'll go through the various pieces. But if you were paying close attention during Greta's talk, then this sort of hashtag thing, um, which wasn't called hashtag when I defined it in 1995 or 94, but uh, now it's taken on a, a sort of a different meaning. Um, so that combination of the strips, and I picked the symbol because to me it looked like you're putting two strips on top of one another, which is actually what you end up doing, and we'll see that coming up. So this theorem, 
basically gives you a series of determinant, which is why I've called it determinantal identities. So there's lots and lots, even for small, well, not for tiny tableau, but for something like 5441 or something not too big, you can get 20, 30, 40, you can get a lot of different determinants just from taking a different, um, different value for the thetas. So I'll go through that. Um, so two things that I need to point out here is, is this hashtag thing that I've, I've already mentioned, but then also this tau piece. So the hashtag thing is really just something I called an outside decomposition. Tau is a shift operator. And I will say we only need this because we're doing ninth variation. So again, if you pay close attention to Greta's talk, she didn't have that. And that's because the version she was using didn't need it because it wasn't dependent on content explicitly in the same way the ninth variation was. So what I need to do now is explain these two pieces to you, the hashtag kind of piece and the shift operator kind of piece. So the hashtag, so first of all, these come from what we called outside decompositions and um, this way of splitting the tableau into strips. And it's, um, I think it comes under other names um, border strip decompositions or rim ribbon decompositions. So you essentially, and I'll explain what the, the rules are, Greta alluded to it, but um, the next slide will tell you more. You split the tableau into strips where everything has to belong to a strip. Then you take the strips, you use them to create a matrix. You use them to create actually sure functions in your matrix that are subscripted by the the strips are various combinations of the strips. And what you get, there's actually is a general procedure and things like the Jacobi Treaty and the Jean Belli are special cases of this. So these are the strips. The rules are they have to start on the left or bottom boundary and they have to end on the right or the top boundary. And if you have a skew tableau, the boundary really does include the part that you've removed the the uh, the mu portion from. So if you want to look at the red one, he actually does end on the top because you've removed the um, the skew portion. So that's permitted because that's now become part of my part of my top boundary. So the idea is you take your tableau, you split it up, respecting these rules, and then you label all of these ribbons by some theta subscripted. And we're gonna use these to then make the matrix and then the determinant. So the idea is if you've given the tableau, um, it's actually to do with the shape, it's less to do with the numbers in it. I've left the numbers in it and you see now the significance of the color. So the color matches uh, which strip it's actually in. But if you take the shape, you split it into strips. Any way you can split it into strips respecting this rule will give you a determinant. So that's why there are so many of them. So if you look at the shape, you can think, well, there's lots of ways I could, could split it into strips. It doesn't have to be three strips. Um, it can be whatever number you can get as long as you respect the rules. So as I said, that was in my thesis for the ordinary shear functions about 10 years after that. Chen Yan and Yang uh, looked at it from a slightly different perspective and uh, brought forward the idea of a cutting strip, which is useful. And the, their vision of it was that it was like there was sort of this master strip that you take and you move through your tableau. And you've got it there in the red and the, the blue. And sort of as you go through wherever it hits it, that determines which shape the strips have to follow. So the content of the cutting strip is important because what you'll see is that essentially any box that has the same content has to sort of have the same wiggle in the strip. So you're always going up or you're always going across depending on what the content is. So the cutting strip is kind of nice because it's sort of this master idea to keep you your head straight on well, does this go this way or does this go that way? It, 
it's always the same for the content, uh, depending on what it is. So here are some pictures. Um, and I should give Ron credit, King credit for the pictures. So all of the diagrams I'm showing are actually from our papers and uh, he's responsible for the diagrams and, and the, the quality examples, frankly, too. So the row is the Jacobi Trudy, the column versions, dual Jacobi Trudy hooks, the Jambelli, the inner rim is the Kramen result, which, uh, which again, Greta mentioned briefly. The outer rim is a Lascou Pragash. So, these are sort of the maximal cases in a sense. Um, the hook and the, the inner rim is sort of the biggest inside rim you could pull off and the outer rim is sort of the biggest outside. And each of these things are, if you had a cutting strip um, in the blue, then what's sort of the biggest, um, biggest one you could, could pull off and that becomes your cutting strip. So that's how you split it into strips. But now I have to tell you about this hashtag operation. So this is a method for combining two strips to produce a third strip. So I said that you could split it off into these things and then you use these things to make others. So basically what you do is you put one over the other and the starting point of the new strip goes from the starting point of one strip to the ending point of the other and vice versa. So in fact, you get two depending because you've got two starting points and you've got two ending points. And when we put them in the matrix, the fact you've got two is, um, I was gonna say it reflects the fact it's reflected about main diagonal, but those too many reflections. So of course, you're gonna have an IJ entry, which is gonna reflect the combination of strip I and strip J, but you also have a JI entry. And one reflects picking the starting point of I and the ending point of J and the other starting point of J and the ending point of I. So I'll show you more examples in a second, but I wanna then back up and talk a little bit about the shift operator. So as I said, in the ordinary sure function case, you don't need the shift operator. You only need it because we're going to be needing the content. And the shift operator basically reflects the fact that the strips inherit the content from the original tableau. So when I take them and I put them together, then suppose I end up with like just one box, for example. And if I tell you I have a sure function indexed by one box, you'd say, okay, one box, that's content zero. Let's go do something with it. But no, if when I combine them, it happened to have been a content two box, I still want it to be a content two box so that you don't say, well, it's sure function with content zero, you know, I'll weight it by X K C where C is zero. You can't do that. It would have to be X K two where two was the content. And I'll have an example in, in a second, but that's the reason for the shift operator. Cause there's this sort of memory to where, where did I come from? So this is the same example I've been moving along with. All the numbers here are content, okay? So there's no filling numbers at all. These are the three strips, and these are the contents from the three strips. And this is the matrix I could produce with the three strips. The entries on the main diagonal are just the strips themselves. And then the off diagonal entries or what you get by combining them as I was describing in the air. So if you reflect about the main diagonal and you see the, uh, the JI counterpart to the IJ entry. And so you see the one in the middle there, he's got a, a minus two as his content. This was what I was saying. This is why we need to worry about him. When I talk about him later, I want the content for that box to be minus two. I don't want the content for that box to be zero. And again, with the sure functions, the content doesn't show up explicitly in the indexing, so you don't need to worry about it. But when you go to the ninth variation, it's important. So this is the kind of determinant you get. So that's the determinant for that particular tableau. And that's why the shift operators are, are living there. So in terms of proving it, 
It's essentially a Lindstrom Gesolvino argument. I'll say just a little bit about the lattice paths. So you have to set your lattice paths up, particularly in and the underlying digraphs. So the 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 uh, diagram below does a lot of the work for you. Uh, Stembridge has a nice paper from 1990 that actually emphasizes the role of of the underlying digraph. So I index then on the left hand side by the weights that I'm going to have. So these will be the entries. So k equals one, two, three, four. These are going to be the entries in the tableau. Are going to I'll have a four in my tableau. So I have a row of weight four. Across the top are the contents. And again, this is a, implicit for the sure functions, but we explicitly need it for the ninth variation. Uh, I have the cutting strip on the side, and essentially the cutting strip tells you how to set this up. So the cutting strip, um, you'll see sometimes I have diagonal entries and the diagonal lines in my digraph all end on a green entry. And that's because at least when I picture it, I picture roaming through the, the cutting strip and starting on the lower left-hand corner and then kind of driving through. And if I'm driving up, then it's a green entry. And if I'm driving over, then it's a brown entry. And you'll, if you're paying close attention, you'll notice that for the first box, you do have a bit of a, a choice. So that one that's a three bar, am I driving up or am I driving over? And in this case, I've chosen I'm driving up, but you have a choice for that. Similarly for the last box, um, when you leave, you can, you can leave from either direction. So that stuff goes, that, the previous slide is all to do with the geometry of the tableau. So it's got actually nothing to do with the numbers in it. When you put the numbers in it, then you can define the actual lattice paths. And this is an example of what this one looks like. So I have the X's and they're subscripted by two numbers again, by the content and actually by, by the, uh, the element that's actually sitting in the tableau. I won't take the time to explain, but some of them start on the top, some of them start on the bottom, and it's pretty easy to see when you start on the top and when you start on the bottom, and vice, or additionally, when you end on the top and when you end on the bottom. Um, but I won't go into that, but that's completely determined. So that's what they look like then. A lindstrom gesolvino argument will give you the determinant. So now I'm going to move on to the ninth variation supersymmetric shear functions. So what I talked about for the ninth variation ones, then that's in one paper I have with Ron King. Then in a subsequent paper, we asked ourselves, can we do it for supersymmetric? And you remember that at the beginning, I talked about supersymmetric and I said, well, you're going to have a couple of sets of variables. Your tableau is going to be a bit different. So you need to account for all of these things and then you need to worry about what the lattice paths are going to look like because now I have all these extra variables. So I promised you at the beginning I was going to show you a supersymmetric tableau and basically tell you to forget it because I'm going to now tell you about the kind I really want to talk about. So the difference between this one and the one I showed at the beginning is I've got the X's and the Y's, I've got the blue and the red intermixed. So essentially our result says you've got to have some blue ones, you've got to have some red ones. And I'm not going to demand that the blue ones show up before the red ones. So you do have to have an order to them, but you're allowed to have blue ones and red ones intermixed. Here, in fact, are the rules, which I didn't show you for the other case because I didn't want to get into it because I wasn't going to talk about it. But there is a total order on primed and unprimed entries. The uh, Everybody weekly increases across the rows, weak increase down the columns. If I've got a couple of unprimed entries that are identical, uh, I, they can't both appear in the same column. It's okay to appear in the same row. So in the third row, I have two blue ones. That's fine, that's not a problem, but I couldn't have a one above a one because they're both blue. And then for the red ones, I have the opposite restriction. So under that one, I just drew your attention to, I have a pair of red three primes. That's 
fine because they're primed. I can have two of those in the same column, but nowhere could I have a three prime next to a three prime in the same row. Okay. And so taking those, then I wanted to find ninth variation of them. And essentially I'm gonna do it in the same sort of way as I did for my ninth variation sure functions. So, except I'm gonna index some of them by Y's and some of them by X's. I will have to just back up a little bit. So you'll see if, if we, you look at the, the upper right-hand corner, there's an eight in it. There's actually no eights in the weighting because I take the order. So the eight is the fourth blue one. So because he's the fourth blue one, he's X four. And the content of that box happens to be five. So that's why he's X four five. So I do need to take the position of the, um, the position of the, uh, the blues or the reds to use that for the weight. And that's partly because instead of the way I had it before, where it's insisting I had them all at the beginning or all at the end, because they're all mixed up together, I, I need to, to take account of that. So now I can define a ninth generation or variation generalized shear function. I put supersymmetric in brackets because it generalizes the supersymmetric idea, but they're actually not supersymmetric. So I will give you the factorial ones, which are supersymmetric, but um, so that's why I kind of hedged my bets on calling it that. And again, it's the same idea with the weighting we just saw. Then you define a sure function. I won't spend too much time on this, but this is because I spent lots of time talking about it in the ninth variation case, but it's the same story. So you define a cutting strip and an outside decomposition. This is a bigger tableau, so we have more colors. And the lattice paths get wilder and wilder. Um, and again, you can, the nice part too is that you have red intermixed with blue and the underlying um, directed graph handles this. You just keep track of when you have blue ones and when you have red ones. The weight of the steps is gonna depend on where they end. So for instance, I've got a blue two, any step that ends at height two has to, will be blue. So I have some going up and some going horizontal, but they all, everybody who ends at two is a blue one. For three, everybody ends, who ends on row three is a red one. And again, you have the blue ones going, only going up or across and the red ones only going down or across. And that reflects this condition I had about, could you have more than one in the same row? Yes, if you're blue, no, if you're red, could you have more than one in the same column? No, if you're blue, yes, if you're red. So that's why I get different kinds of shapes for, or different kinds of steps for my various colors. The paths look like this. And again, we've got tons of colors, but it's the same idea, the same sort of lindstrom gesselvino argument works. And this is what the actual identity looks like. Again, very similar to what I told you for the ninth variation. I've got my shifts then I have to shift my X's and I have to shift my Y's as well. So there's, there's two shifts on those. And then for the last little bit, I'm gonna tell you about the factorial supersymmetric shear functions. Because again, I said the ninth variation ones are nice, but they're not supersymmetric. So can we find something that is, can we kind of take a step back? So you remember that the ninth were kind of the, the ultimate in McDonald's paper. And then the, the, uh, the factorial ones were a previous version. So these are, um, if I take a step back to kind of a previous variation, can I get the, uh, the symmetry? The answer is yes. So again, if you were paying close attention in Greta's talk, you already know what the factorial shear functions are. Um, if you weren't, then I'll remind you. So they're again, they're a uh, tableau and I'll see, we'll see a tableau on the next page, but they're the same kinds of regular shear function type tableau but you're weighted with not only X, but this A piece. 
which has content involved in it. So it's got the entry involved, but also the content. So again, this was the same tableau as before. And then underneath is the content piece. And then what the weighting looks like, where you've got it weighted by X's and, and A's. And I will comment that this factorial sure function definition. So as I said, it appears in McDonald's paper, but also at the same time, Golden and Green uh, discovered essentially the same factorial uh, sure functions. So there's, there's a dual credit there. Then can you do this for supersymmetric functions? And so this is Molev's version. It's not exactly the same as ours, but I'll mention it in interest of history or if you've seen it, because you can go from ours, you can show, um, there's quite a bit in the last bit of the paper showing that, uh, that Molev's definition also is, uh, can be derived by making the right choices in ours. So his definition, he has the primed ones first and the unprimed ones second. And then I'll draw your attention to the weights. So it's very similar to the weights you have for the factorial sure functions, but in the supersymmetric case, you've got the Y's and you're subtracting the A's in that case, in the Y case. So what did we do? We can't do it exactly the same. We need yet another um, this one's not a shift. It's got a Greek letter, but it's not a shift. I won't spend too much time going through all the details just to give you an idea. It's going to show up on the next page. Um, the one at the bottom shows you what, what these sigmas look like. Essentially, they kind of keep track of whether you have a lot of blue ones together or a lot of red ones together. So if your steady state is if you alternate red and blue, so you'll notice the second row doesn't change much if I go from a blue to a red or a red to a blue. But if I have two blues together or two reds together, then it either increases or decreases. So it's kind of keeps track of whether you've got a lot of blue ones together or a lot of red ones together. Um, and I won't take too long to go through the, all the details of why that's necessary. But basically you need to employ that in the subscript of the A. So if you remember back, or you don't have to remember, I'll show you Molev's A's. And right at the very bottom of the slide, there were XK plus AK plus C, and then YL minus AL plus C. And then ours, we have to have this little shift of the A. We can't just use K and C. And that's essentially because we've intermingled the blue and the red entries. So because we're allowing that wonderful freedom, then we kind of have to pay for it later by taking account of, of how far we may have wandered off. This is merely our tableau, what, what the weights look like. Um, so it's sort of a combination between the one I showed you for the factorial and then of course the supersymmetric again, you see the eight in the upper right hand corner, that's X4 because it's the fourth of the blue, uh, the blue entries. So you've got that thing going on. And then you've got the weighting on the A's related to this Sigma R thing I just talked about. And if you do all this, then it turns out it's super symmetric. So I said the ninth variation ones were not, this one is, and again, I don't have time to go through it. So it's an intricate argument of going through cases and, um, actually looking at if you have R's in your tableau followed by R plus ones, and then you switch the order of them. And that, so that's the kind of flavor of the argument, but we can show it's independent of this ordering. So I made a big deal about, we have the blues intermingled with the reds. So we can show that it's actually independent of that invariant under the permutation of X and Y um, and independent of the T, which Right back at the very beginning, I said this was the, the stuff you want for supersymmetric. You want it to be um, invariant under the permutations of the variables and then independent if you make this, this one substitution. On my last slide, I mentioned just the papers of mine that, uh, that I mentioned. So the Hamill Golden one, which Greta showed you uh, a copy of the first page of. 
but thankfully didn't do all my entire talk for me. Um, and then the two papers that I mentioned with Ron King. So that's. Are there any questions for Angel? Uh, the question I think is to the reference of like, is there a version for shifted pitch also for these variations? So the question was, are there very uh, versions for shifted shapes? Um, like for Q functions? Yeah, so Q functions. So there is, um, so way back when my name was still Hamill, I do have a paper for the Fafians for the, the shifted ones. And that was actually in my thesis too. Um, because the paper of Stembridges that I mentioned actually gives you nice ways of setting up things for Fafians as well. As uh, so, yes, so the outside decomposition and so on will give you Q function Fafians and some determinants as well, kind of that back off from that. Um, and Ron and I do have the one in the middle is Fafian identities for the ninth variation ones. So, yeah. I guess I'm also for like so the question was, are there versions for factorial growth and geek? Probably, I haven't, we haven't looked at it, but I, yeah. Almost anything, if you can set it up with the right directed uh, graph for the underlying of the lattice paths, then it just follows right from, I keep going back to Stembridge's paper and you know everybody has their favorite tools they use. That's, that's one of mine. So, so I would imagine, yes. But again, sometimes you get tricky things in terms of you know, the content, because we had to do the shift for the content and stuff like that. So you have to be a little careful that things don't get messed up if you're uh, relying on too much, too much uh, stuff that you've inherited. So the question was for the ninth variation, whether it, there's a shuffling of the entries and it doesn't matter whether which one you. Yeah. Yeah. So you choose them and you, it doesn't matter what the choice is as long as you're consistent, it doesn't, that's what we, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to answer the question and repeat it at the same time. But, but that, that, that's right. So that's right for the, the super symmetric, but the, the other ones, you're just putting them together. Like there is a fixed order for those, okay. um, which I didn't quite get into, but yeah. I do, but yeah, but the the big thing about the factorial super or super symmetric ones was it doesn't matter the order. And in fact, the super symmetric ninth variations, yeah, you you fix an order of them, and then you go from there. But you want to come back tomorrow and fix a different order? That's fine. And yeah. If I, if I start with a fixed order and I want to say like, this is doable, I see in your model that it's not matter. So that would change the underlying so the question was if i want to fix the order and switch to would that can you see it in the model um so that's exactly what happens for the factorial ones the the whole argument is that but that's about the symmetry but in terms of the lattice paths you can see what happens in the underlying digraph because that's where that's the level it kind of determines um yeah, which kinds of steps you have allowed, if I've understood the question right. Anyway, yeah. And we have time for another question, if there's any further. Okay, if not, then let's thank Angela again.